And I think there's a huge amount of room for new ways of doing things, totally new ways of thinking where I think young people can play a very important role to, to bring this forward. And part of our work will be <coughs> to try and create a, a receptive environment to these suggestions from young people, because we know that uh, there are barriers, especially in, in our culture. Um, <coughs> How can African policies be made different? What you asked a specific question about mentorship for young young professionals as they go into service. I guess it's something that can be organized and structured, but we know that in African countries we do a great deal of in-service training. We organize a lot of uh, workshops. We spend a lot of money in bringing people out of the workplace to be in places where there is training. I, I think it would not be too difficult to ask some of the more experienced health workers to volunteer their time and to be linked to a specific young per person and themselves to learn how to nurture and support somebody, not just in delivering a lecture at a workshop, but in an ongoing relationship where you get to know the person. I'm sure that older people will be prepared to do this. So for this, there needs to be an openness of mind for both sides. I, I guess the mentor can also learn from the mentee. Or you can provide some new innovative ideas and help the older people be better able to supervise and support, <coughs> not in a judgmental way, not in a condescending way, young people. I mean, that, I guess you are young African people. You are brought up in a certain way. I've got two young women who uh, and have lived all over the world with us. <coughs> when they go back to South Africa, I have to sit them down and say, okay, remember you're going home. So older people are going to speak to you like this. So try and be a flexible to this. And I also start try and say to my relatives, my other daughter complains a lot that you don't respect boundaries, you tell her she's gained weight, you tell her she's thin, you ask her when she's next getting married. So I think there could be adaptations on both sides. And, and I think all of you would love to, to learn from young people about how to adapt ourselves to the new context in which we're leading and trying to support. But I, I think that uh, we could promote and, and innovate. You're working in a country which is very innovative. So that, that could be one country in which we try this out, how to have a structured approach. And I'm sure there will be many health workers who are willing to share their experiences, skills with young people in an ongoing uh, mentorship relationship. So, so that's something that we can try out. Um, sexual and reproductive health for services for, for young people. I guess th this is something on which we have decided to put more attention in the nature. And I think we can find opportunities in some of the existing and better funded programs. For example, some of the work going on in HIV, we have a lot of funding for HIV in countries. The group that's most affected by HIV is young people, especially young women, young people in general. How to put an emphasis in all that work going on, on sexuality education, empowerment, skills building, and service adjustment so that even the HIV services are able to be more orientated towards the needs of young people in a very explicit way. I think these are some of the things that, that people do. So there's a, there's a huge opportunity now with this new agenda, every woman, every child, with a special emphasis on young people. And I think we can work together to find ways where young people's voices are heard, your, your thoughts about what to do are heard. For example, as far as leadership is concerned, we know that African elders are very threatened by the idea of open discussion of sexuality with young people. Okay. We are sexually active ourselves. We hope if we're lucky. But we don't want that to be acknowledged by young people. And when I talk to my, my daughters about sexuality, it's like, okay, I, I have to be this teacher. I'm not even acknowledged I myself have a sex life. Which I do since, since I'm married. I mean, okay, yeah. So how to bridge these gaps in a safe way where the older people feel able, not only as fathers and mothers, but as leaders and policy makers to acknowledge this is what we need to work on. There's a very good example of the first lady of Namibia, who is youngish, but you know, who is herself the mother of, uh, I think she's got a child in her in his 20s, and who, when she was expected to leave work on dealing with the health problems of young people and, and uh, women, organized in nightclubs, dialogue with young people. She said, okay, I want to talk to young people where they generally go. So they go and be bring them to a luxury hotel or go into a classroom where we often find young people as well. But it's where they go, where they drink alcohol, where they uh, uh, 
might get engaged in uh, unsafe behavior where they make friends. And she had, she reported to us really creative work in engaging young people and getting some very honest <coughs> dialogue with them, including with some young men who had been in prison for raping young women and getting those boys to talk about what's happening in their life, what are the challenges they're facing. So we need such opportunities, and I'm sure that because young people will be sharing their thoughts, their feelings, their experiences, so that the policies can be informed by your voices. It's very important. Thank you. This is off to an exciting start. Um, maybe we'll take a ra another round of questions and see how we do. So we'll take one from here and one from the end. Yeah. All right. My name is Aaron. I'm a communication strategist with Rich Hand Uganda. And my question is, in the main in the main conference, we're talking about research. And you're going to find that when we are coming up with policies and decisions addressing young people's needs, young people are used as subjects and not participants. How do we get to move away from young people being, being put out there as subjects? I don't try the participants involved directly in the research. Thank you. And as the mic moves, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but I forgot. Those are the hashtags we are using. So please tweet, tweet, tweet. And let people know that Dr. Wet was kind enough to come speak to us. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Mera. I'm a journalist at Daily Nation newspaper. My question to Dr. Moiti is, uh, how is the WHO involving the youth in transformational agendas such as uh, achieving universal health coverage? We have an opportunity for one more question because I don't know if we have another round. Is there anyone with a burning question? Hi, my name is Francis Uto, and thank you so much for honoring us with your presence here. My question is about um, the move uh, towards uh, harnessing the demographic dividend mm -hmm. and what is going to happen after that. Um, today in the morning we're talking about uh, disaster preparedness and I think as we push towards harnessing the demographic dividend, how can the youth now prepare to be, so that they're not caught unawares after the harnessing of the demographic dividend? Because um, we also were also told yesterday that we are moving from aid to trade given that a lot of funding is moving out of, uh, from, from donor funding. So we're moving into trade. So how do we ensure that young people will be involved at that point? And not just as, um, as a secondary response, but as a primary response. Thank you. Thank you. We'll give Dr. Monty an opportunity to answer this question. Thank you. Um, so how can young people be participants in research and not uh, just subjects? I think, again, it's finding the opportunity and having the space made for young people to speak to those who design research, those who decide these are the research priorities, which hopefully are based on the health needs in countries. And I really think that it needs to be um, finding ways for researchers. A lot of, a lot of research in, in African countries is done by academic institutions. And much of it is done in partnership with funders from outside. So it's being said in the, the question was asked, when will African governments invest more in research? So it's, it's hard to have the spaces for young people to influence those decisions about these are things on which we are going to invest money for research. And again, it's having, it, I was very excited, for example, there's a program called uh, the European Developing Countries Partnership on Research, EDCTP, which is investing in young African researchers, training young academics, so young people, young, young lecturers, PhD students, master's students who are being trained in how to do research and also being funded in how to carry out research. But so I think we, have, we need opportunities for young people at different levels. Influencing research prioritization and policy, having the opportunity themselves to be trained and have their skills built up, built, built up in research, and having the funding to carry out research, doing collaborative research with, with others. Again, this needs to be decided in the fora where governments with their partners make decisions about this. So I think our role is to make the space for young people, make sure that the young um, lecturers, young, young people who teach at universities, who carry out the research, 
how can they be linked with the ministries of health? One of the things that we are trying to do in WHO is to bridge that gap be between those who do research, the academic institutions, and those who hopefully use the output, output of this research to develop policies and programs. And the researchers very often are young people, or sometimes are young people. Of course, quite often it is professors who've been there for years. But if you dig around beyond the professors, you'll find young researchers there. So it's to encourage those young people and to give them the space to make their contribution to say, actually, if you did research like this on these subjects, it's relevant to what are the needs of the health services or prevention programs. So I think in WHO, we have a research advisory committee which works with our health systems team and with myself. And I'm asking our director who's here to take note. We need to get onto their agenda also the role of young people in research, not only as subjects, but also as, as, as researchers. Because if you, if you look at our investors, there are also young people who are learning how to do research. So let's um, harness that, uh, that capacity. Uh, you asked the question, how, you, how are we involving young people in, in our strategies, including on universal health coverage? One of the things that we are trying to do in the WHO is actually bring in young people into our organization. I think that's a, an important start. We tend to be a very middle-aged working group. So because how you get into the WHO, your experience, when we design, uh, when we define positions and we write the requirements for the post, you need to have 10 years experience, blah, blah, blah. So that's already cutting out a certain demographic. So it, by the time a young person has that, uh, by the time a person has that, that, that level of experience, they are no longer young. So we are making a conscious decision in WHO to expand the range of positions so that we can have young people coming in at more junior levels who can change the way of thinking and working and we can benefit directly in our own work in the uh, creativity, the thought processes, the experience, innovation of young people. And I think this is something that we can also recommend uh, in ministries of health. Certainly, we are, as I said, defining adolescent health as one of our key um, priorities, and we are using that as a test of our universal health coverage work. So, if our strategies can deliver for young people, they'll be delivering for everybody. And in order for that to work, we are finding ways to engage young people and get their input as to what is the best way to look at issues of uh, inequities, access, young people's uh, and services, availability uh, availability for people who are not working a job where they can leave their job and come to the clinic at 10 o'clock in the morning when the clinic is open, and finding ways to make sure that for women who are working in business and can't come to the clinic during working hours for young people who are dissuaded or discouraged from coming into clinics, we find avenues to, to cater for those people. So these are some of the ways in which we can involve young people and most importantly we are defining indicators and mechanisms for assessing if this work on universal health coverage is progressing or not and I can think of no better group to give feedback and give a reality check to our patients and young people as to how you are experiencing these services that we are trying to, to develop and how you can bring in the opinions and views and uh, advice of other young people to inform the WHO and to inform the ministries of health and some of the partners that are supporting governments to develop health services. And harnessing the, the demographic dividend. I guess we, we have this young population that will be there in different cohorts for many years in Africa. So we're not going to transition out of this demographic dividend quickly. What we have to do is to be really smart about how to give young people opportunities, um, first of all, so that they don't uh, migrate to Europe, so they stay here and engage with our countries and try to, to improve the countries. But if, to do that, they need opportunities. They need jobs, they need a good education, they need financing, uh, they need opportunities to use technology. And uh, personally, I'm very encouraged when I look at what young people are doing with very little money to do startups or businesses using technology, encouraging each other, etc. So I think what, what we need to do is to define what will a good leveraging of the demographic dividend look like in, in 10 years, in 20 years. What would we want to see happening to young Africans in order to know that we've done the right things 
and young people have got the opportunities to contribute to the health and to the economies of their country. I think we have to make sure that we are monitoring what's happening around access to education, the quality of education, making sure that girls get into school, stay in school, acquire a skill, and are able, if they can't get a job, at least to start a business, to work with other people, to get a decent livelihood is very important. How this is enabling young people to protect their own health, how this is enabling young people to teach the next generation to have to live healthily, how we are dealing not only with uh, communicable diseases, but also in the long term with non-communicable diseases. Because it's through speaking to you now about your lifestyle that we are going to prevent you by the time you're getting to your 40s from having uh, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, and, and so forth. So I think it's very much around investing in young people in multiple ways and monitoring to see that some of those different um, goals in the SDGs that are so important as they relate to young people, we are making progress on them. And uh, finding ways to have scorecards for our leaders, I, I think it's very good that the African Union is represented at this conference because we have a huge opportunity at the summits of our leaders, even at the continental level, the sub-regional level, in the East African community, to hold up to them a mirror of this is where you are with young people. This is how we are harnessing, or we are wasting the opportunity of harnessing the demographic dividend. Because we can't afford not to jump on this. Otherwise, what we'll have is a very large number of poorly educated young people who don't have job prospects, who are living in deeper and deeper poverty, and that's just looking for trouble. Not only for the young individuals, but also for the countries themselves. Thank you. And that brings um, us to the end of our time with Dr. Mwete. Unless you'd like to give us some closing remarks. No, I, I think just, if I can say anything in closing, it's that you are a handful of young people who had the opportunity to come to this conference. And I'm quite confident that behind you, you are representing colleagues, friends, family members, where you have the opportunity to look for their views, speak with them, I'm sure you're doing that already. Find opportunities. Whenever I'm in conferences, you chase it after me and says, I want a picture with you. I want you to sign on to something or other. So we need more and more of you to be, um, if you like, be the face, you are the face, you are the voice of young people and make sure that the leadership takes notice of young people. Yeah, I, I like the slogan where you are insisting that nothing should be done about you, without you, and you need to find partners with whom to work who can repeat that and ask the question. If I'm at a conference where there's no young people, what's going on? If we're talking about health, in Africa, if our average or mean age is 18, 19 years, where are those people? They need to be here, both as professionals, which I'm very happy to see here, and also as members of the community, as, as representatives of uh, communities in, in civil society and so on. So I'd just like to encourage you to carry on, to be the spokesperson of other young people, engage them, and knock on those doors. Don't give up. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time, and in my tradition, I will ask you for another photo, but this time it will be a cool Instagram photo for I had, and then after that we'll release you. Oh wow, okay. <laughs> Very easy. Yes. <laughs> Could we lift it a little higher? Because you are cutting off the hair. Oh.